Hello, friends. Welcome back to this series where we go through and explain the book on quantum mechanics by Steven Weinberg. In the last lecture, a way to define angular momentum is found using the theory of rotational symmetry. Such a definition is very general and can include both intrinsic and orbital angular momentum. In this lecture, we shall continue this approach to derive the eigenstates and eigenvalues of this operator using just symmetry arguments. J is the sum of the orbital angular momentum L and spin S of a quantum system. This is the true generator of rotations as established in the last lecture. We have defined rotations in terms of the matrix R, which rotates an ordinary vector in three-dimensional space. R can be expanded in terms of the rotation parameters omega, which is itself an anti-symmetric matrix. This anti-symmetry is due to the fact that R preserves the magnitude of any rotated vector. This two-index omega is actually related to a single-index version in 3D space. It is precisely this single-index omega that pairs with the generator J at the top. To give us the unitary representation of rotations in the space of quantum states. This representation, together with the algebra that must be satisfied by all rotation generators, reproduce the correct composition rule for rotations, and thus justify our definition for the representation of rotations. These sum up the key results of the last lecture. Our task now is to find the eigenstates and eigenvalues of the total angular momentum J. These states will be useful for explaining the multiplicity of spectral lines as mentioned previously. And we shall do this in the most general way, using just the commutation relations that must be satisfied in any representation. That is, using just the algebra of rotation. Even though J is written here as the sum of L and S, it could also mean L or S, as we are just using it to represent any vector that satisfies the relation in the blue box, which both L and S do. As we shall see, this problem of finding eigenstates and eigenvalues is easily solved if we know how to relate it to a previous problem that of the harmonic oscillator. Recall that for this system, we have identified the ground state of the system, which is defined as a state that is annihilated by some lowering operator A. This is just the lowest state of the number operator, A dagger A. Finding the eigenstates of the number operator will be equivalent to doing so for the Hamiltonian of the system. The reason we can call A the lowering operator and its conjugate A dagger the raising operator is all due to this commutation relation, which we have shown in lecture 17. Here's why A dagger can act on an eigenstate N to give us a higher energy state. Expanding out this commutator, we have Applying both sides to the state N and using the green box. Thus, we see that A dagger turns the state N to the state N plus 1, raising it by one step. This immediately allows us to generate all the eigenstates by repeated applications of A dagger to the ground state. The lowering operator A satisfies the similar commutation relations with the number operator, only with a minus sign. This minus sign directly leads to the lowering of the eigenvalue by one step. 
This is how the lowering operator gets its name. These two equations can be combined into one by defining a plus and a minus like so. Similarly, for the commutation relations, this equation in the yellow box is the key to the workings of the ladder operators. Let's construct the angular momentum analog to the yellow box using the rotation algebra. We claim that J3 is like the number operator and J plus minus the ladder operators. J plus minus is defined as J1 plus minus IJ2. Let's work out the commutator of these two operators. From the blue box, the commutator between J3 and 1 is just IH bar J2. And between j3 and 2, minus i h bar j1. We can bring this plus minus out of the bracket. Thus we have the angular momentum analog of the number and ladder operators. All the extra h-bars are due to the fact that angular momentum has the dimension of h-bar, while the number and ladder operators of the harmonic oscillator are dimensionless. Let's denote the eigenstates of J3 by the cat's m with eigenvalues h-bar times m. This means m are dimensionless. Besides this, we make no assumptions about the possible values of m. Specifically, these may not be integers like for orbital angular momentum. We should view this as an analog to the eigenvector equation for the number operator. How would the eigenvalues change with the application of j plus minus? Just one unit of h bar. This is clear by direct comparison with the harmonic oscillator case. Thus the action of J plus minus on the state M gives the state which corresponds to M plus minus 1. By this argument, we can deduce that the spacings within the values of M are integers but we still do not know the exact values of m. We shall get to this in due time. Let's work out some more commutators of j that will be useful for solving its eigenstates. An obvious one is to show that, once again, the square of j commutes with its third component. This would imply that there would be shared eigenstates between these two observables. The quantum number j is taken to be the eigenvalue parameter of j square. Its exact relation to the eigenvalue will be worked out in a minute. We shall calculate this commutator using just the rotation algebra above, so as to obtain a general result that would cover all representations. Instead of just showing j square commutes of j3, we shall show that it in fact commutes of any component. Again, Einstein's convention applies here. The index i is summed over. Expand this using the product rule for commutators. These two commutators are the same. One with j i on the left and the other on the right. We can write the second term with the dummy index i and k interchanged. This is so that the indices of the two operators j match on both terms.
With the epsilon symbol anti-symmetric in the indices i and k, we can switch back their ordering, incurring a minus sign. Of course, this means the terms cancel. Thus, we have proved that j square commutes with any component of j using just the rotation algebra. This has the following obvious implications. The first, as we have already mentioned, means that j square and j3 share the same eigenstates jm. We have denoted the eigenvalues of j square as h bar square multiplied by a dimensionless function f square. This is an unknown positive function of the angular momentum parameter j. We shall define this parameter more precisely in a moment. First, let's show why f square has to be positive. This has to do with j square being a positive operator because it is a square. If we take the bracket of this operator with respect to any state psi, each component of j square has to be positive, since ji acting on psi is just another state tilde psi, which must have a positive inner product with itself. So if we take psi to be the eigenstate of j square, this record would just be the eigenvalue multiplied by the inner product of the state jm with itself, which is also positive. Thus we see that f square must be positive, which is why we made the square explicit. We can compare the eigenvalues of the operator j square and the square of its third component by taking the bracket of their difference with respect to their shared eigenstates. Since this is just a sum of j1 square and j2 square, both square operators, by the same argument we have just gone through, this bracket must be positive. Now we can just plug in the respective eigenvalues. Thus we see that f square must be greater or equal to m square for any state j m. This relates f square to the maximum of m. So we might as well define its argument j to be actually the maximum value of m. And we shall denote the minimum to be j prime. It now remains for us to solve for the function f square and the values of j and j prime. Let's first work on f square. To do this, we shall need the ladder operators for angular momentum. We know that j plus minus acting on the state m, which is the eigenstate of the third component, gives us a state one step higher or lower. But when we apply this to the state j m, how can we be sure that j is unchanged by this operation? This is guaranteed by the fact that j square and the ladder operators commute, which is what we have shown earlier. The red box implies that we can move j square across j plus minus to act on the state j m, which gives. Thus the action of j plus minus doesn't change the quantum number j. For the case of the harmonic oscillator, we first find the lowest energy state which cannot be lowered any further as expressed by this equation. Then get all the other eigenstates by using the raising operator. We can be sure that no states are left out by this procedure because the equation in the red box has a unique solution. There is only one ground state. This is proven for the harmonic oscillator in lecture 17. 
This is the corresponding equation for angular momentum. But instead of a state with the lowest eigenvalue, we have a jm state with the largest m, where m equals j. This is known as the state with the highest weight. Therefore the equation says that we cannot raise this state any further. The right hand side must be a null vector, since otherwise the left hand side would just be another state with an even greater eigenvalue, leading to a contradiction. We will now work out the function f square in terms of j using this equation. We start by applying j minus. From the definition of j plus minus, this product is given by This identity in the yellow box for the product j minus j plus will appear quite often. This operator is in fact acting on its own eigenstate and can be replaced by its eigenvalues. Assuming that this state is not a null vector, Thus we finally have the relation between f square and j, which is the maximum value of m. We will now show that the state with the largest m is the only solution to this equation. That is, no other jm state with m not equals to j can be a solution. We begin by supposing that there is another solution jm with m not equals to j. Applying j minus to this, we again have the product j minus j plus and can use our earlier identity. Acting on their eigenstate, these operators can be replaced by their eigenvalues. Note that this expression is not equal to zero, since m is not equal to j. We shall denote this by the absolute square of alpha plus with arguments j m. Now divide on both sides by this constant. Thus we see that for m not equals to j, the state j m which is supposed to satisfy the same equation as the highest weight state, must be a null vector. And so, cannot be a state vector. Therefore, the highest weight state is the unique solution. We can then generate all the other jm states using the lowering operator. The entire set of states thus generated, all of them sharing the same eigenvalue for j square, is known as the j multiplet. Let's start descending. After moving down j minus j prime number of steps, we will reach the lowest weight state. m equals j prime. Applying j minus any further will give zero. Next, we can apply j plus instead. This will lead us to an identity for the product of j plus j minus which is reminiscence of the earlier identity in the yellow box with the plus and minus switched. 
Both of them come from the following. where we know the reversal in polarity of these two signs. Once again, because these operators are acting on their eigenstate, Thus we have a relation between j and j prime. Being a quadratic equation, this has two possible solutions. The first is obvious, j prime equals j plus 1. We can immediately throw this out, since j is the maximum value of m, therefore its value cannot be j plus 1. The second possibility is j prime equals minus j. This is allowed. So the minimum value of m is minus j. Let's count the number of states within this interval. There are two possible configurations. For the first, there is a state at m equals 0. Remember that the interval between states is 1. For the second configuration, there is no state at m equals 0. And the nearest state is half an interval away. Both configurations are symmetric about 0. For the first configuration, there are j number of states above 0 and the same number below, plus 1 state at m equals 0. So the total number of states is 2j plus 1. From this picture, j is obviously an integer. The second configuration is slightly more complicated. Let's denote the number of states above 0 by n. From the picture, the value of j is simply equals to n minus 1, which is the sum of the intervals between the points above 0, plus half. The total number of points is just 2n. Thus, the total number of points is also 2j plus 1. From the second equation, we can see that j is of half integer value. Thus, the total number of states for a fixed j is just 2j plus 1, similar to the purely orbital case. And we also have the result that j can only be an integer, or half integer. These are the most general results regarding angular momentum, both orbital and intrinsic. All of them just comes from the rotation algebra. There's one more point we would like to make about the normalization of the states J, M regarding their phase convention. Recall that these states are related to each other by the ladder operators. Let's write the constant of proportionality explicitly. This is the alpha we have introduced previously, but only its absolute square. The expression in the yellow box is only for alpha plus. We shall work out the general case in a moment. Let's take the inner product of this vector with itself. We have used the fact that j minus plus is equal to the Hermitian conjugate of j plus minus. 
assuming that the states J and M are also normal. This term is just one. There is another way to evaluate the bracket on the left hand side. Notice that we have again this familiar operator product. If we let this act to its right on the cat J M, the action of the first operator raises or lowers J M, and we get. The second operator then acts on this resulting cat, which lowers or raises in the reverse direction to give us back J M. Take the bracket of this to get the left hand side of the above equation. These two expressions must be equal, which implies that the complex conjugate of alpha plus minus is equal to alpha minus plus with m shifted by plus minus 1. This leads to the following relation between their magnitudes. We will need this later. Let's work out the absolute square of alpha using this equation. We can apply the earlier identity to this operator product. Then replace these operators by their eigenvalues within the bracket. And thus we have our result. Note that the plus minus superscript of alpha matches this one here. Let's write the magnitude of this below. The phase of this complex number is Ei theta, which may also depend on m. This is the phase we are going to deal with by our convention. Let's look again at how the entire multiplet is generated by descending from the state jj. After we have chosen some vector to be this highest weight state and fixed its phase, all the phases of the lower states should then be fixed by the lowering operator. One step below the highest weight, we can absorb the resulting phase of alpha into the lower state and define a new state with an overbar, which is physically equivalent to the original state. This is done at every step of lowering. The key feature of this convention is that the constants associated with the lowering operation, that is, alpha, are all real and positive. For the highest weight state, Bar or no bar are the same. We can use this relation to express any lower state in terms of the one one step higher. This recursive relation defines our convention for the JM states, and we shall take away all the bars to simplify notation. Thus, once we have selected the appropriate highest weight state and lowering operator, the blue box will deliver us the entire J multiple. But there is one more consistency check that we have to do. Since the operation of lowering the states already fixed the phases of all the states, we need to see if raising the states will again bring in new complex phases, which we no longer have the freedom to absorb and breaks the convention in the blue box. So let's apply J plus to this equation to raise the state back up and see what happens.
Using the relation between alpha plus minus and alpha minus plus derived earlier, we have Thus we see that the raising operation is consistent with the convention of the lowering operation in the blue box. We can use this equation to derive the matrix element of angular momentum. Let's do this for the simplest case, for j equals half, which describes the spin of an electron. The components of angular momentum can be expressed in terms of j plus minus. j3 can be left just as it is. Since we are evaluating these matrices in the basis of the JM states, and J3 will simply be diagonal. For J equals half, there are just two states forming a doublet. They are respectively the highest weight state annihilated by J plus and the lowest weight state by J minus. Let's see what these two equations tell us about the matrix elements of J plus and J minus. The rest of the matrices will simply follow from these two. Let's start with J plus. Its matrix elements are defined by the brackets, where M prime on the left is the row index and M the column, with the following numbering convention. The equation in the red box tells us that the first column, which corresponds to the index half, are all zero. What about this entry? This corresponds to the raising of the lower state to the higher state by J+. Plus which should be equal to the constant alpha plus with m equals minus half. Using the definition of alpha below, we have which is just h bar And lastly, this entry, which should be zero. Since by raising from m equals minus half, it is not possible to remain at the same value. Thus, we have the matrix for J plus. With our convention, the highest state is a column with one in the upper entry and the lower state in the lower entry. Let's test this by applying the matrix J plus to the higher state. This gives zero as expected. Now to the lower state, which just raises it to the higher state with the right constant. And for the matrix J minus, we need not do any more calculations, since this is just a Hermitian conjugate of J plus. Now we can use these guys to derive the rest of the matrices. First, J1. Then J2. J3 is just a diagonal matrix with these two columns as eigenvectors. Thus, 
Thus, we have all the angular momentum matrices in the JM basis. These are often written in terms of the Pauli matrices. S is the vector matrix, which represents the spin of an electron. There's one last theorem about angular momentum that is quite easy to prove, which we will need in the next lecture. Again, this is the result of the raising and lowering operations in an angular momentum multiple. We consider the most general case where the states may contain some parts associated with other quantum numbers that are unaffected by rotations. That is, the action of any generator of rotation will leave them unchanged. Note that J is one such quantum number since the observable J square is invariant under rotation. Let's denote such a state by psi Jm where psi is a label for all the other quantum numbers. A different state with different other quantum numbers could be labeled by a different symbol, for example, phi. Let's form a bracket with another state, phi. Note that m must come with plus minus 1 to match the ladder operator. And the bracket on the right should be proportional to the bracket of j m plus minus 1. Let's look at the bra on the left, with j plus minus acting to the left. This is the Hermitian conjugate of the cat below. This just gives Let's focus on this alpha. First note that these two signs are reversed in polarity from the definition below and leads to the cancellation. So we have Substitute this back into the red box. And we have the result of our theorem. This says that the inner product between any two states phi and psi with the same quantum number j is independent of the value of m. We may express this independence by hiding the quantum number m. If you like this video, consider giving it a like and subscribe to this channel and get notified whenever a new video is ready. See you next time and thanks for watching.